So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to start this panel today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Andrea Passarella from uh, the National Research Council IIT Institute from uh, in Pisa, Italy, and uh, I have the uh, honor to co-chair this uh, event with my colleague Claudio Cicconetti, also from CNR, on this uh, very exciting topic quantum internet evolutionary and revolutionary perspectives. Uh, Claudio will introduce our distinguished uh, panel. Uh, the nice thing about the topic is that um, it's uh, emerging, it is disruptive, but uh, we have many, many open directions in front of us uh, from the most disruptive, disruptive and long-term ones to uh, the ones that uh, um, involve uh, concrete applications uh, on which we can already play with uh, with real devices already today. So it's a really a fa fascinating uh, topic. I believe you are all convinced about that. And we have an exceptional set of panelists to, dis to, to discuss about all these uh, uh, directions open in front of us. Uh, so without uh, losing uh, additional time, I give the floor to Claudio, who uh, is uh, actively working uh, with other people in our group on this topic. Claudio, by the way, has uh, recently won the Quantum uh, Internet Application Channel 2023, which is a prestigious uh, <laughs> achievement in the European uh, community working on quantum internet. He will introduce the, the, the panel. Uh, for all the audience, remember that you are welcome to ask uh, uh, questions in the Q&A, not in the chat, in the Q&A. Uh, you have uh, the Slack channel that is uh, up for discussion even today or after the panel is uh, is over. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we go through the panel uh, presentations and then we uh, collect the Q&As uh, at the end for, uh, for all of them. Okay, thanks a lot again, Claudio, you are on stage. Thank you very much, and I am so excited for being here. And uh, it's a great honor to uh, introduce the distinguished uh, panelists uh, of today. So we have uh, Bernardo Huberman, who is a technology pioneer and a futurist, and uh, currently he's a vice president at Table Labs in the US, where he started the quantum communications activities. And then we have Marcello Caleffi, who is a professor at the University of Naples, and he is an active member of the uh, Quantum Internet Research Group of the Internet Research Task Force, where he co-authored uh, the first quantum internet RFC on the architectural principles of the quantum internet. And then Stefano Ritter, who is the director of applications of quantum technologies at uh, Toptica in Germany, uh, where he founded the Quantum uh, uh, Solutions team, and is also the, the leader of the innovation team of the Qu uh, Quantum Internet Alliance. Last but not least, we have uh, with us uh, uh, Stefano Pirandola, who is the founder and CEO of NodeQ and a professor of quantum computing at the University of York. And uh, Stefano authored so many seminal papers on the, the, the quantum internet. It's a pleasure to have you all. And uh, we can start, uh, wow, sorry, uh, uh, th th this should have been a bit before, but we can start in uh, this order, the, the presentation. So we will go with uh, Bernardo first, then Marcello, Stefan, and Stefano, uh, last but not least. Again, please uh, uh, write as many questions as you like in the Q&A uh, button. St Bernardo, the floor is yours. I stop sharing, mm -hmm. you can share your screen. Thank you. Let me share my screen again. Uh, where am I again? Okay. Uh, here we are. Okay. So I'm going to go into presentation mode. Okay. Well, I am going to say things that for the panelists, perhaps that are obvious and trivial. I don't know who in the audience is wondering not about a, all of this. Not the apologies, but we don't see your slides. So maybe. I'm sharing the screen though. Hold it. Oh, that's odd. Okay, you, now it's you coming. Them? If you go in presentation mode, we should be all set. Yeah, great. Thank Perfect. you. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so 
as I said, I, I'm going to say some things that are obvious, but nevertheless uh, provides us a certain context. So the, the whole thing about quantum networking encompasses many, many things and also certain motivations. Uh, many of you, of course, this is obvious, but there are two remarkable facts about quantum physics that are actually underlying the whole technology. One of them is the idea of the principle of superposition. The quantum systems can be in many states simultaneously uh, until they are measured. And the other one, entanglement, namely this incredibly almost magic uh, situation where separate entities can be strongly correlated and interact almost instantaneously because there is no, no real interaction. They're just entangled over arbitrary distances. And these two things have led, this is 1925, but since uh, the 60s or so, in particular quantum optics people, we've now started to see a quantum engineering effort that is leading to very, very, many exciting things. And I, I'd like to talk about some of them. First of all, the practical implications. Uh, one of them, which is still a little bit far into the future, is the idea that you can build a quantum computer that uses superposition and entanglement to create a massively, infinitely parallel machine. Uh, so there, what I the, the real interesting thing is that this quantum computer not only can simulate real physical systems on a very large scale that today can only be done classically at a, at a much slower uh, pace, but also can also solve a very interesting set of problems that have to do with cryptography, coordination, and so on. Um, quantum computing, at one point or the other, seem to be very um, far-fetched idea, but as I mentioned now, we are starting to see incredible progress. The second one is that you can enable interesting interactions. Because if you have a system where you can actually have this um, entanglement in particular and superposition, you can make communication systems super secure, okay? As well as solving coordination problems, I'm gonna give an example very soon, <clears throat> that are impossible to solve in a classical world, okay? Now, the most important thing is that uh, eventually, and many of the participants in the panel are noted for the pushing this idea, the idea of an entangled web, the idea that eventually we'll end up with a network, hopefully, you know, uh, next to the standard internet that will allow us to interact with quantum computers and with each other using quantum protocols. And that is something that is an incredibly active um, activity in many countries, in particular in, in Europe. So um, I think that when we talk about security, we know that the issues that we care about are confidentiality, integrity of the data, authentication, and cryptography. Now, this is something that has been going on for many, many, many years. And the important thing now is to, of course, to um, see why is it that quantum offers a solution that before that was not available. Well, here, before I do that, let me just give you a little bit of a sense of what classical computers and quantum computers can do. There are many problems like factoring very, very large numbers, uh, simulating a chemical reaction at the molecular level and so on, that it would take in particular for a classical computer many, 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 many hours. If you have a many body problem of uh, 10 to the 20 particles and you want to see all the interactions evolve in time, it would take almost thousands of years to do that, including the problem of factoring. Quantum computing, on the other hand, can do that in minutes. And this is not just a claim that we make on a paper. There are several examples of that nowadays. Uh, Sycamore is a computer that actually has taken 200 seconds to solve a problem that would take 10 to 10,000 years. <clears throat> and very recently in China, the Juzang machine uh, took uh, 200 seconds to resolve a problem that it takes half a billion years to solve with a classical computer. Doesn't mean that these things have scaled to the point where you can actually use them and program them. I mean, that's a little bit too far. And I'd like to mention to those in the audience, I mean, here the experts know, that the big problem is not so much to create these qubits, which are the quantum bits in a computer and to move around, is the error correcting problem. Because as you know, systems decay very quickly when they interact with a classical environment. So error correction is really the stumbling block in a way for making a computer like this. So. There are two solutions to the problem, authentication and security in telecommunications. And there are two camps uh, actually in this. One of them is called the so-called post-quantum cryptography. These are people mostly populated by mathematicians that claim that you can actually create codes, 
mathematically codes that are, will be very, very hard, if not impossible, for a quantum computer to solve. Okay, now this is a, a long history. I mean, we, not all, we know all the protocols we have today, but and then the problem is that every time they're coming with one, they have been broken. Rainbow and Psyched, which were actually uh, proposed by the National Institute for um, and, uh, what is it? NIST in the United States, was broken one of them with a laptop, uh, two students did it. So even if someone came with an a, a code, mathematically based code, that cannot be broken, they're not, they don't know if in the future it would be broken, okay? There is no proof that something cannot be broken. On the other hand, as we all know, if you have quantum key distribution, since the effect of measurement disturbs the system and collapses it into a classical state, it would make it makes it possible to have very, very, very secure com uh, communication because it's guaranteed not by mathematics and ingenuity, but by the laws of physics. Okay, so um, let me tell you about a problem that many, many people sometimes that work in, 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 in quantum optics and so on are not very familiar with, that quantum mechanisms are not just for solving the problem of um, uh, communication that is sort of, you know, secure and so on. They can also solve very interesting coordination problems because quantum systems, you can put one piece of a quantum entangled state, say in the moon and one on the earth, and someone who measures that state in the moon will know what the measurement in the earth of the, the, the other pair of entangled, you know, say particle or state will be. So, <clears throat> Coordination is a huge problem in economics. And as a matter of fact, I even published a paper on, on coordination in, in, in the economics field where, you know, two firms have to coordinate what they sell and, and buy, what uh, these decisions that are made. And it's beautiful to know that we can do that without um, essentially having to communicate. And so, for instance, you can run some auctions that where two participants in the auction can bid in synchronicity while not communicating, but being an entangled state and so on. So let me, I'm gonna give you now a very simple uh, example of something we implemented. So we're talking about things that are um, real, which is the idea of the frequency hopping spread spectrum technology, which as you know, has been around since the 1950s or so. So the idea here is that uh, Alice and Bob, they communicate by having a system that was designed actually during World War II that hops be between frequencies of the transmission channel. So an eavesdropper will find it very, very hard to essentially follow that. So th this idea suffers from two things, two problems, even though it's being used, actually, it's a very, very active uh, area, not just of research of applications. This uh, suffers from two problems. First of all, Alice and Bob need to eventually coordinate what is gonna be the sequence of uh, uh, the frequency hops that they're gonna have. So either they get close together physically and then they separate or someone has to essentially carry information from one place to the other. The, the second one is, and this is a very interesting problem that the um, <clears throat> very recently French researchers using machine learning were able to take the frequency hopping uh, sequence and with machine learning being able to predict the next frequency. Why? because this frequency hopping is not truly random. It's pseudo-random or some sequence. And as you know very well, basically today, very large neural nets and other machines and so on can actually predict the next sequence of a bunch of numbers or symbols, given the fact that they are not random. So that's a very big problem. So one, one solution to this, obviously, and you know this is why I'm talking about it, is to use actually quantum entanglement to coordinate Alice and Bob, now they don't have to communicate with each other what, what it's going to be in your frequency there. They both can measure it using quantum key distribution and use quantum superposition to make the sequence truly random. And actually we implemented this. We have a paper just coming out in Clio where we actually used a software defined radios. And so we have a, a, a system which uses a quantum key distribution network that we have in our uh, laboratory. And Alice and Bob then can not only get the keys, but the frequencies as they keep being transmitted by the system, okay? And this is probably secure, okay? Now, someone can go to Bob and uh, uh, point a gun at Bob and show the, you know, what extract the key, but that's a different story. We're not, we're talking about the system and not necessarily some of the human components. So 
Let me now, uh, I, I apologize if I'm speaking fast, but I know time is of the essence here, and I want to say a couple of things. One of the biggest problems we are having in, in, with this field, in particular the acceptance of quantum versus post-quantum, at least in the United States, is that many communication companies, telecommunications, are saying, well, if this is real, I don't want to implement it and if it costs me a lot of money. So we want to make these things very, very practical. And this is one of the real issues that we have. I work for a nonprofit institute that is supported by the you know, uh, communication companies. And basically they all say, this is all very interesting, but you know, how much is this gonna cost? It's something, you know, I don't wanna start using, putting dark fiber in order for the system to communicate. Satellites, as we know that some governments, in particular the Chinese have put some satellites in orbit that can transmit entangled photons. So the whole thing is at the level of practical implica applications is where really the, the frontier in some sense is. So let me talk a little bit about that. But before that, I'd like to tell you that this quantum network and the entangled network that many of the people that in the, our distinguished uh, panel uh, work on is, is going to be an incredible thing. And the reason why it's incredible is because we are, it will enable most of us, and I'll say that why I say this, to have access to this computing. You're not going to have a quantum computer in your living room unless you're a billionaire and you have a you know liquid helium uh, <laughs> Uh, temperature cooler systems in order to run it. So we will be in the cloud. In order to communicate with a quantum system, with a quantum computer, you'll need an, an entangled web. Okay, so this is, post-quantum will not do that. And this actually opens the possibility for quantum ISP services that could actually sell or rent optical channels, entanglement as a service, and a bunch of other things. And my presentation to some of the <clears throat> executives in the industry has so far intrigued them. I'm not saying that they are jumping to uh, the implement, but many, many of them, uh, Liberty Global and Vodafone and in the United States Charter and even Comcast have expressed interest in these ideas. So now <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about some of the problems. The, the, one of the big issue here is that in order to do this, you need to have you know, a quantum channel with an optical classical channel uh, between Alice and Bob. The big problem is that if you were to have to implement it separately is costly. Can we do that internally with it, what we already have? Well, most of you, all of you know, that RAM and noise is a big problem because if you're sending a quantum signal, which is very weak next to a classical signal, the RAM and scattering of the classical signal is gonna go, you know, it's gonna swamp the data, the, the transmission, you know, the information that you're trying to send. So that's a big problem. And what I'd like to show you is a solution that we actually implemented over actually 100 kilometers <clears throat> and that it works. And that, um, first of all, let me tell you roughly, well, many of you, I think that can read these slides without me having to go in, all in the detail, okay? But the basic idea is, can we interleave the quantum and the classical signal in the standard fiber C band, okay? In such a way that the intervals between the classical transmission are, used in order to send the qubits, okay? And this is something we are not the only ones working with that. Toshiba was doing it as well and many other laboratories. Uh, we managed to use techniques that actually are published now uh, that we presented at the Optical Fiber Communication Conference in Glasgow, the European one, and it's now published. We were able to do this over a distance of 100 kilometers, okay? There are some issues with that, but uh, nevertheless, it works, at least in the laboratory. The other problem, and I'd like to make you all aware of that, that the real problem is not so much to put quantum key distribution in the backbone of the internet, and that will allow you to communicate with cloud computers and so on, is to have access networks. As you all know, we have fiber <clears throat> optics going up to a certain point, and then there are you know, access, you know, in access points or neighborhoods where essentially everybody connects there. So the issue is that while today we're doing point-to-point -point transmission, of qubits, a much more challenging problem is to do point to multipoint, okay, which is using the PON technology. Now, point to multipoint has been tried, and actually there are several papers that describe that, but to do that using the standard channels of the fiber that as I described is still a, a, a problem that you know is not completely solved. Well, I I looked at my watch, I realized that I spoke very fast and I said many things. So I would like to stop here and next, let the next one speak. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Bernardo. That was very insightful. Okay, let, let's move uh, to the to the next speaker then with uh, Marcello. Yep. When, when when you are ready, you can share the slides. You have eight minutes. The floor is yours. Uh, can you hear me? And then remember if I have okay. So <clears throat> uh quantum internet for what? Why and how? So in our lab, we have uh, the, the main core is about the design of the protocol stack. This is what we do. We would like to design a protocol stack for the quantum internet. Why the main or the killer application or one of the first application of the quantum internet that we write about was distributed quantum computing. Because if you interconnect the multiple quantum computers, your computing power scale exponential instead of just linearly like in classical computing and how this is the the key word that i will try to spread during the this five minutes is entanglement entanglement generation distribution is a fundamental task why because networks quantum networks are real quantum networks only if they exploit entanglement and it's true that um the the there are several test that, that we are deployment over the world. But please let me stress the fact that unless these test beds share entanglement, from our perspective, they are not true quantum networks. They are just classical networks equipped with quantum security. So you can find several test beds where single photons, so qubits, are spread over hundreds of kilometers Instead, when it comes to distributing entanglement, the distances and the test bed are much more limited. In our case, we are trying to distribute entanglement over C band, like was saying Bernard before, coexisting with classical uh, channel, classical communications. But the core is that we don't want to share qubits, we want to share entanglement, and this makes everything much more complicated. Okay, so. Uh, part of this presentation is taken from a couple of papers. You will find the reference here. Now, the, the name of this uh, panel is evolution versus revolution, okay? And here I'm saying that I'm with the revolution side of the, of the world. And I'm first question is, can we evolve a classical internet into quantum internet or should we, revolve, should we go with a revolution? Okay, so what is evolution? Gradual changing. And if I have to make an example of an evolution from a network perspective, I will say wireless LAN versus local area network versus Saturn. That was for me an evolution. We had a protocol, a set of protocols, a couple of protocols, a couple of layers for interconnecting computers with a cable. And then we changed something, physical layer, and something also in the um, uh, link layer. And we had an evolution. And what is a revolution? Well, I think that packet versus circuit switching was the real evolution from a network perspective in the last century. Before of this evolution, we need to go back from telegraph versus postal services. And I want to point out this uh, spectrum article, the internet that wasn't, is not so cited, but for me is a very interesting perspective about the what was called the protocol. So uh, TCP P versus circuit switching was a revolution. Now, what is the distinctive feature of a quantum network? I'm quoting some sentences from the RFC that um, uh, Claudio was mentioning before. So first, the request for comments about quantum internet with a bunch of great co-authors. Entanglement is the fundamental resource of a quantum network and of the quantum internet. It's not qubit. It's not superposition, it's entanglement. And the non-classical correlation of entanglement is what a real quantum network wants to exploit. Now, the question becomes how much entanglement is different because we want to transmit or we want to share, or we want to distribute entanglement in a quantum network. How much is different sharing entanglement from transmitting information? Because we have 
a network, a global network, internet, which transmit information well. Uh, this is a paper from my group or a paper from a paper from my group. Our uh, perspective is that the differences between entanglement and information, it doesn't matter if it's classical or quantum information, the difference between entanglement and information are so huge that they affect the design of the full protocol stack. You cannot just change a layer. Changing a layer will be an incremental evolution. We need to redesign the protocol stack. And I will try to give a couple of examples. Quantum information is a local resource. It means that there is one node, the forwarder node, the transmitter, it depends from the perspective that you have on the network, which is in charge of transmitting, so of stepping uh, down the information through the route. Uh, and there is only one node at the time that has the information that can manipulate the information without coordinating with other nodes. Entanglement is a non-local resource, which involves at least two actors. And these actors, if, that can be more than two if we have multi-party entanglement, need to coordinate before using the entanglement. And a coordination among multiple nodes is not something that has been solved in the classical network. And the value of entanglement versus the value of information is radically different. Information, when you have a packet, there is only one node that can, be, that can have a value, can benefit from this information, the receiver. The other nodes retransmit in the store and forward paradigm of classical internet, the information, the protocol, the, the packet, sorry, just to help the network, but they don't have any uh, practical or theoretical value in retransmitting the information. When you have entanglement, entanglement is a global resource. Any node that share entanglement with another node can benefit from this entanglement. So the value of the resource is regardless of the concept of transmitter and receiver. There is no transmitter and there is no receiver. There will be one node exploiting the entanglement which has been shared by several nodes. So, from our perspective, designing the protocol stack for the quantum internet requires a major paradigm shift. We believe that we are closer to the revolution side of the network design more than the, uh, than the evolution side. Now, let's say that we have to make a design revolution. Well, there is a good aspect from our perspective, or at least from a perspective of a professor that is teaching computer networks with the same books that he was using a student. And the books are two, either Kurosoros or Tannenbaum, and they haven't been changed in the last 30 years. So every year that I start my class is with the same slide. Well, and why is that? Because classical internet, has this hourglass shaped architecture. Now, the good thing is that I want to stress that this picture has been used or has been presented by Steve During during his plenary talk at IETF, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force plenary talk in 2001. So in 2001, they were already aware that we have an issue with IP but there was no incentive in changing IP because the rule that I tried to teach to my computer network student is if it works, you don't touch. And this is a fundamental rule for anyone which has been in a server room or in a switching room, okay? So we have IP, which is the winner of the internet evolution. And this should be like, TCP IP implementation, which is still practically the same since 1979. So it means that while all the uh, IT infrastructure has been dramatically evolved over the last 40 years, so kernel, modular versus monolithic kernel in operative systems, uh, programming languages, everything has been evolved. Uh, Network professors who are stuck with Crosser Ross, Tannenbaum, IP, uh, Ethernet, and uh, Haloa for, for more than 40 years. Well, 
there is a good news from a teaching perspective. We can start changing our slides because we have finally a different uh, paradigm. We don't need to transmit information. We need to share entanglement. And actually, we should not only uh, change the design because we have to change. We should want to change the design, trying to design new protocols, trying to find new solutions to all their problem. Uh, for example, synchronization, frequency hopping, synchronization so it was a possibility, uh, far from my interest, but actually a perfect example. I will steal the example about frequency hopping and entanglement I will reuse in the future by paying some uh, fees, some uh, honorary fees to Bernardo. But for example, my killer application is carrier sense multiple access or any high medium access control or medium access channel. So, Bottom line, we are at the frontier of uh, revolution and we are lucky to be here because finally, after 40 years, we can try to give a significant contribution to network design. I think that I'm more or less in the time, hopefully. So yes, you have. Thank you very much, uh, Marcello. And now we can uh, go to, um, to Stefan. Stefan, you can share your slides. Thank you very much. Uh, I think you will see them now and uh, I just go ahead. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to talk to you today. And I'm very thankful for the uh, introductions that Bernardo and Marcello already gave because I can build into that. What I want to do in my eight to 10 minutes is uh, to present to you the Quantum Internet Alliance, which um, is a group of, of uh, researchers, uh, both from academia, uh, companies that um, have a common goal and uh, this common goal is to able, enable quantum communication between local quantum processors anywhere on Earth. And the means to do that is by distributing entanglement um, as, as a resource, as we heard from Marcello. That is kind of um, the moonshot goal that we are aiming for with the Quantum Internet Alliance. So the question of why quantum communication was already exemplified by Bernardo, but I want to build on that. And uh, we've heard about the secure communication aspect uh, as to QKD, secure quantum computing in the cloud as an application. There's also a synchronization of clocks, uh, connection of sensors, uh, privacy preserving technologies like coordination technologies, and ultimately, obviously, quantum computing clusters uh, of, of remote quantum computers. Let me say that use cases for the quantum internet are still heavily under development. And I think what we need is some co-development of uh, the technology to build it, the software and, and the application space. What's super interesting about the quantum internet is that the functionality um, that, that you have kind of defines which protocols you can run. And the more advanced the technology, also the more challenging the technology, the more different things you can do. So certainly we are at a stage where we have trusted repeater networks uh, for doing QKD, um, but what we aim at with the Quantum Internet Alliance is for sure quantum memory networks going all the way to quantum computing networks that can enable all of the different applications that the quantum internet uh, can have in stock. For this, we've gathered a quite diverse group of uh, stakeholders and, and uh, partners participating in this, quite a few universities and uh, research institutions, because this in part still is fundamental research, but already also research and technology organizations who have experience with uh, bringing things uh, into the market. Uh, significant industry players, we are super proud to have quantum startups on board, quite a few um, and, and other partners that are all sharing this same goal. Now, why, why do we still need such a, such a diverse group? That's because um, word is not out yet as to which technology is best suited for this. At the heart of all quantum internet technologies are quantum memories, um, kind of quantum storage devices that you can write into and read out of uh, photonic quantum information. And this can be something as simple as a trapped atom or, or ion. It, it can be an ensemble of that called atomic gases. 
it can be dopants in, in solid state like like prasitinium or, or color centers in diamond but it can also be completely artificial systems like like quantum dots for example all of those serve well as quantum memories and you might wonder why i am coming from a quantum uh, information background uh, but now since many years working for a laser company uh, i why i'm involved in that and uh, why Toptic is involved in that. And that's because all of those quantum memories have different transition frequencies and require very, very different lasers uh, in order to initialize, address, manipulate, read out these quantum memories and do the interconnections via the network. So as I said, it's not clear yet which system is going to be, be the best. There's certainly going to be hybrid systems. We have many approaches with quantum wavelength conversion at all of them. Need need different lasers um, in wavelengths, in power, in in frequency stability, and and phase noise. Uh, obviously, it makes a difference whether you have them in a more research like setting or whether you want to deploy something in the field. In a way, the good thing from an economic perspective is that there's lots of synergies with what we do on the hardware front in quantum internet with uh, quantum computing because basically. They're using the same qubits, and also optical clocks have strong relations to this. In QIA, um, we are aiming for a twofold effort. One is to build a prototype network where we can validate all of the key subsystems. But then also, we want to be an innovation hub um, for this new technology that engages with all types of stakeholders. So let's talk a little bit about um, the prototype network that we're building. It's meant to be full stack. Um, consisting of metropolitan networks that uh, are interconnected by quantum repeaters. And, and that's because you cannot use classical repeaters because quantum states cannot be copied. They cannot be cloned. So quantum repeaters is, is a way to, to mitigate that. Uh, the metropolitan networks can be um, either full-fledged processing nodes or photonic clients um, with limited low cost um, functionality, but still useful for some very interesting protocols. On that, by the end of the decade, we're gonna run uh, test programs, namely teleportation, proof that we can operate above the classical limit and blind quantum computation. As I said, there's co-design with the use case team uh, engaging with early adopters. And because we want to be kind of dedicated. We have the system engineering crack uh, where we radically focus on, on building this prototype network. And then because there's different advantages and disadvantages of say physical systems to be used or alternative ideas, we explore them in what we call a design alternative crack. We have an architecture team to coordinate uh, on the technical side, also support with modeling and simulation. Uh, I talked about the use case team um, doing protocol analysis, for example, also engaging with early adopters. And we have the innovation team to, to make sure that uh, all the technology um, is there and, and this for the good um, of, of the society. Last slide, I want to say that we um, have cu uh, currently launched uh, at the Mobile World Congress uh, the QIA Technology Forum. It's an open forum that we are connecting academia, ecosystem partners, industry, key players with. Um, anyone who is any entity that is interested in interacting with the Quantum Internet Alliance that wants to find out um, about what it is we are doing, how to connect, is invited to, to become a member of this QIATF. And uh, the work that we are doing is organized in special interest groups on, on different topics. The first two are already forming. And uh, I'd be very happy to uh, tell you more if you want to get in touch. So there's basically two ways uh, to do that. You can uh, drop me an email, uh, stefan.ritter at toptica.com, or uh, have a look um, at the Quantum Internet Lines website. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Stefan. And now we can move to the uh, the, the last of our uh, presentations. It's my pleasure to leave the floor the, to Stefano. You can share the slides when you like. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio and uh, uh, Andrea for, that, for this uh, invitation. So uh, can you see the slides? The slides? Yes, Sorry? but not in full screen, however. Yeah. <clears throat> can you see now? Okay. 
<clears throat> so okay, so sorry. sorry. <clears throat> okay, so uh, thank you much again. So uh, yeah, um, I'm here to um, participate. This, this, this is a very nice uh, interaction, and I'm CEO of NoQ, uh, which is a startup company uh, dealing with the quantum security and quantum networks. And I'm also a professor in quantum computing and information at the University of New York. I want to present very briefly in one slide NoQ, and then I will talk about you know quantum internet and how I I, I see it. Uh, <clears throat> so NoQ. So it deals with high performance quantum networks okay so we 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 are really looking at uh, the near term uh, quantum security but also the long term distributed quantum computing clearly quantum network is is a very uh, big umbrella name and, and it may be used you know for quantum safe networks in the near term or i mean for quantum computing networks in in, in the longer term and how and how uh, NoQ is tackling the problem is basically the intersection of these three main areas. So clearly, quantum. So we deal with quantum commodities, uh, the entire stack of uh, quantum safe and quantum communications. Uh, we uh, we optimize networks, um, resorting to advanced methods, including machine learning. And finally, we deploy uh, our optimized solution through uh, software defined networking. So it really, it really is uh, you know, an overlap of three main uh, uh, hot topics, and it's, it's amazing to to work in this in this area at the moment. Right. So uh, let me tell you about quantum uh, internet, the quantum ecosystem. So uh, again, quantum internet is a very uh, big uh, umbrella uh, entity, and there are three main interconnected tags that we can consider. Of course, quantum communication, which is uh, from the from QKD uh, to uh, network quantum computers, interconnected, quantum compute itself that provides exponentially faster you know, uh, uh, computing performances, but also quantum sensing. So things like improved detection, imaging, path recognition, and so on. And all these areas can be I mean, beautifully connected by, uh, by the quantum internet. Now, uh, in terms of quantum inter internet development, I um, let me share this kind of you know stack of uh, process. So uh, I have like a la layer zero security and layer layer one security. So I put like a security the security problem at the, at the very bottom of this of this stack. Now, post quantum crypto is not by itself quantum, but it is a quantum enabling technology because it may be used for, for example, authentication in a quantum distribution. And, and anyway, it's a quantum related, a quantum related uh, you know, uh, commodity notion to, to be considered. That's why I put that in level zero security. And again, it's, it's, it's important for, for, for authentication anyway. Uh, we have QKD connections. QKD uh, is, is very important. is the very first, you know, uh, let's say a cheaper way to, 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 to create a quantum network, in this case, a quantum safe network. Um, we have uh, around also a classical quantum cloud, so the possibility to connect through the classical internet to quantum processors. So, so this is happening today, and perhaps this connection may also be quantum secure at some point. But I mean, this is a certain technology which has been developed a lot in the in the very last uh, years. What is more challenging is repeaters, so creating like uh, devices that are able to distribute entanglement between a lot of remote parties and interfaces like you know, uh, trying to um, be able to convert, especially between different uh, frequencies. These are very uh, important enabling technologies for, for, for quantum internet. I will, I will tell you more about this. And finally, you know, what we can be called a quantum quantum cloud. So the situation where quantum computers are connected by quantum links. So you really act you have you know quantum information which is uh, uh, transmitted or teleported between two quantum information quantum computers. So this is pretty different between uh, there's a much a big difference between this kind of cloud and what we have now. I mean on the internet, which is just I mean accessing uh, you know classically uh, quantum processors. Right. So uh, the important point is that quantum quantum cloud. I mean the, the fully quantum you know uh, cloud is is likely to have like an hybrid structure. So we need to interface different technologies. That's why we put interfaces at the very top here, uh, a level. So we have like a quantum communication, quantum processing, quantum storage, and these are all based uh, with. Uh, I mean the the best technologies for these different tasks are based on are, are different basically. So use photons for communications. 
probably you want to use superconducting for quantum processing and for quantum storage you probably want to use solid state uh, like uh, you know rare earth crystals and so on so this is a very important see this um, structure uh, has to be hybrid now uh, just want to be quick on the quantum cybersecurity part. I tell, okay, this, we have like a post-quantum crypto on QKD at uh, the very uh, at the very basis at the very uh, bottom of this stack, and we are, we are deploying this stuff. Okay, so we have like a piece post-quantum crypto is today, and it's based on computational security, uh, and it's, it's clearly a very fast solution. Clearly, I mean with these uh, with its restrictions, but I mean it's, it's very quick and it's very entertaining also in the market. Uh, we have QKD, which is stronger in terms of information threat security because it's based on the laws of quantum mechanics and there are I mean, a lot of protocols that are going are being developed and and well uh, there are national pack bonds currently being developed like here in the UK but also in Europe and so on and and security uh, for QKD I mean is a set different approaches I mean like uh, we have we have a standard QKD which is really point to point based on trusted node. Trusting nodes, so it's a level, a lower level of security, higher rates. But then we may, we must go up into the you know security level by using, for example, measurement device independent uh, QKD or even device independent QKD. So uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, you know uh, full zoo of uh, protocols and approaches that uh, are have been developed and tested uh, currently. But let's talk about uh, you know the the most difficult part, which is uh, repeaters. Okay, I put uh, here I put entanglement distillers and quantum teleporters, which are uh, uh, very important devices. So uh, what you want to have is that uh, you want to first of all you have uh, to create let's say a distributed quantum computing you know environment or a really true you know quantum internet where two quantum computers are going to be connected. You really want to distribute entanglement. Okay. Oh, well, I mean, to be honest, you have different approaches. Either you can send quantum information in a reliable way using a quantum bureaucratic code. That's an op that is an option. But I guess the most uh, uh, you know uh, accepted the way to do that is by distributing entanglement. And um, so, uh, why you want to do that? Because of if you have distributed good entanglement, then okay, you you can teleport. Okay, you can directly teleport quantum information from one one computer and another. So the, the, the possibility to create, uh, you know, uh, very good distillers, uh, uh, distillers of entanglement is, is fundamental because, I mean, you really want to have, I mean, this kind of, you know, uh, EPR pairs or, I mean, bell states, which are okay, entangled particles, uh, I mean, very good, I mean, with high fidelity distributed between two, uh, two remote parties. And once you get that, you can have like a this kind of process here, which is, I mean, we, we just a very simple uh, uh, representation of teleportation. So once A, uh, say computer A, quantum computer A, quantum computer B, they share an entangled, uh, an entangled uh, uh, state or two particles which are entangled. So you can combine particle A with some other particle C in quantum, quantum uh, state that you want to teleport. You do a suitable measurement. It's like classical communication to the other computer, quantum computer. Then you can reconstruct basically the input quantum state. So what's happening is a transfer of the state of the of the particle from point A to point B. This basically can be used to, to trans, 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 transmit quantum information from one computer to another. That's really fundamental if you want to, you know, have a distributed quantum computing environment. But what are you? When we were looking at this uh, uh, teleportation technology, we realized already in this uh, National Photonics from 2015 that uh, you know we are looking at different uh, uh, features. So you really want to want the teleportation is uh, you know working uh, very well between two you know two remote uh, uh, remote uh, stations. So the efficiency, which means the number of uh, you know, if I send 100 particles to teleported, I want 100 particles to be teleported, not 50%, let's say, okay? But also the quality of teleportation. So the quantum state should be very faithful with respect to the input. And another important parameter is the distance. And if there's a possibility to, to store the, the incoming quantum information through a memory. So when you look at this table, you see there's no winning technology. So the best uh, the distance is achieved by uh, photonic qubits. So we're talking about, uh, you know, optical photons. Uh, the best quantum computing platform is more likely, you know, superconducting. So uh, it's not in that category. It's like in a different category. And uh, the best quantum storage is in solid state, but it can achieve, let's say, six hours storage. Uh, so very long. 
So this this is this brings to the to the problem that we need to to create like a, a you know interfaces and uh, which is basically this key point here in order to have like a I mean a definitely ultimately hybrid quantum internet. And the most important interface that we considered in the recent years is clearly an electro optical mechanical converter, or I mean, just electro, just which is a frequency converter, which is a device like this that is able to, you know, get an input, uh, let's say, microwave photon and transform into an optical photon and vice versa. But the problem is that he has to do this in a way which is efficient. So you really want to transform all the photons you're getting at the input, but also in a way which is, you know, uh, quantum. So you want to uh, uh, maintain, uh, you know, the quantum features of the input. If this is, if, if uh, no matter if they are in the superposition uh, uh, features or if that particle is part of entangled, entangled state and so on. So you really want to do that in a quantum way. That's very difficult, but this is a wonderful, uh, you know, device that will solve a lot of problems. So not just in quantum computing, but also in other area like in quantum sensing in quantum in in, in uh, you know even in quantum radar i mean this would be like one of the, the devices that have been like uh, uh, proposed for for either for quantum radar which is probably more difficult than quantum computing okay uh, so finally we get into the into the final goal the quantum quantum cloud so we have all these elements so we can create really i mean a, a network quantum computers that are connected by by quantum links so i think like something like this right so i may have like my programmable photonic chip here and uh, may perhaps have a programmable superconducting chip here so two different type of quantum computers and they are connected by let's say optical fibers but then you need to you know to use teleporters uh, uh, and distillers and converters. So the distillers here, this D symbol, are going to distribute entanglement, let's say, between this part of the network and this part of the network. And what, once you get this, you can teleport quantum information between these two different sections of the network. But okay, but if you have like, you know, some superconducting chip that you really need also a converter. So there's all this kind of ecosystem of, you know, uh, components that uh, need, need, to be, uh, need to be integrated. And, and clearly, uh, this comes to my uh, very last slide. When we have this kind of complex ecosystem, it's really important to to create a, like a system which is like optimized. So you really have to have like a, you know ju not just a hardware. So not just the construction of you know individual quantum links and nodes in the network. But also you need like something like a software which is able to uh, to not so just uh, design but also to to, to optimize the coordinate coordinate all this all this hardware. So for example. You want to use different type of uh, routing strategies, perhaps, I mean, uh, uh, multi-path uh, routing strategies when the commodity is particularly slow, like entanglement, but also you want to, uh, you know, have, uh, you know, some kind of a coordination of the hardware in such a way that, you know, the converters are optimized, the, distill the distillers are working, uh, you know, in a synchronized way and, and, and stuff like this. So this is a very difficult, you know, but very challenging, but I mean, amazing problem uh, that has to be uh, solved. And, uh, and clearly um, the only way to have like this kind of, you know, quantum internet, which is going to coexist clearly with the classical internet, if, if that's for sure, clearly, uh, is to have like a, a very smooth coordination between software and, and hardware. And that's it. Then, then thank you very much. This, that is, uh, um, well, all for, from me. Thank you very much. And uh, thank, uh, we thank all the speakers uh, for the uh, very inspiring uh, and insightful talks. So we have a few minutes uh, left for uh, questions and answers. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, with one, if you like. Uh, well, Bernardo, uh, the beginning, made a very strong statement so you are not going to have a quantum computing in your living room. In the 70s, we had mindframes, and I guess people also thought that we would never have uh, computers in the living room. But indeed, we have, even in our pockets, actually. Mm -hmm. So does anybody want to comment on this? Well, I would like to answer first by quoting Niels Bohr. It is very hard to predict anything, especially the future. So I truly believe that in a way I, you know, I was just making my own impression that these things are enormous and so on, but you're all right. You know, I, I, I did, I'd love to be surprised in my lifetime to see something that fits into a living room and that's quantum computing. Uh, does anybody else want to comment? Okay. 
Uh, then in this case, I would like to make a, a little game with the panelists. So uh, we know that there have been a lot of investments in quantum computing and quantum communications, but that's not uh, much if uh, this is compared to what we could have if uh, this was uh, profitable in the short term for companies. The investments would be much, much higher cost. When do you think this will happen in years if it you think it will happen? So we're going in order, uh, just give the number so that we can write it down on a post and then you, 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 we will check in a few years if uh, your prediction was correct. We know it, it, is, it is difficult as Bernardo reminded us. Bernardo. Are you asking for the prediction on quantum computing on quantum in the entangling network? Uh, about network, sorry. When, when the quantum internet will be profitable from a commercial perspective. Oh, profitable unless there are subsidies from governments is going to take a long time. It is not clear to me, and this is something, even though I was so impressed uh, with uh, uh, Professor Kalefi's enthusiasm uh, for a revolution, it is not clear to me that the adoption is going to justify the investment very early on. So I think we're seeing already, you know, the early things. But when you say when, I would say that perhaps in 10 years we'll see the embryonic uh, deployments as whether or not you make money of this or not is it's a very complicated question. So, but... Um, I, 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 we see already the early uh, stages of this, but most companies, especially telecommunication companies that are involved in this, are looking at it, they're observing, but they are not interested in putting the immense infrastructure that will require at this point, unless you can convince them that you can use uh, standard fiber and quantum computers are around the corner and they won't cost that much. So I cannot venture in, in, in a, a year, but um, you know, uh, I'm sure other people will. Marcello, do you want to, to give it a try? <laughs> You're muted. When classical internet became profitable for professors since the beginning, <laughs> for uh, telecommunication companies, I will say 10 to 15 years, there can be a possibility to start commercializing quantum secure quantum communications for military applications. This is something that it's out of the corner around the corner. But if you're asking when the economy of the quantum internet will be paragonable to the economy of the classical internet in terms of revolution, well, when there will be people able to invent applications out of this technology and professor or researchers are not the right people, I mean, there was Bitcoin at the beginning. No one understood the, the I'm not saying that Bitcoin is, uh, there has objective value, but at least right now it has an economical value. Why everyone involved in Bitcoin security like us is not millionaire? Because we don't understood the application. So a number, 25 years. That's a number that the time required for classical internet. Okay, thanks. Uh, Stefan? Right. Uh, giving a number is always hard. So uh, what I want to stress is that you have um, this this different aspects and use cases that are kind of building on each other because uh, technologically they have kind of growing, growing uh, demands. And, and so I don't think that there's going to be like one stage, but it's going to grow gradually. And it's by no means a given that this is going to happen. So, so what what we are really concerned with, kind of from from the uh, technology side, is to make this happen uh, in the first place. When whenever, whenever things are ready, um, if I have to give something ten to twenty years. Okay, Stefano. Uh, well, I mean, from my perspective, uh, since I put the security also in quantum internet, clearly quantum security is profitable, profitable now. Um, of course, in these years, every year ten. Clearly, um, what we see, we will see next is uh, really large quantum computing, uh, for tolerant quantum computing. Probably, I don't know. Optimistically, the time the timeline is always uh, difficult to to, to state. Uh, I don't know. Between five, ten years, uh, that, that's hard to say. I would say five, 10 years, five super optimistic, 10 years, probably more realistic, I don't know. 
And clearly, uh, you know, the uh, the idea of the security quantum computing goes very well, I mean, together with this uh, developing large quantum computers. So I would say uh, clearly uh, is going to be based on, you know, you know, quantum computing clearly. So we see on that kind of time scale, I think 10, 10, 15, 10, 15 years, uh, I would say uh, uh, is going to be interesting for, for quantum uh, uh, quantum internet. But okay, um, so again, you... I, I'm, I'm optimistic anyway. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic person. I think, yeah, honest, I think like, like Marcello and others, I think. <laughs> you're all invited to join again this panel in uh, 10, 15, 20, 25 years <laughs> to, to, uh, to check. And now, now I'm, I'm very sorry, but we have to wrap yeah, up. Claudio, uh, before we close, I just want to mention to the other panelists that you yourself replied to a very similar question uh, posed by a journalist saying that the quantum internet will arrive when it will, when it will arrive, not one minute before. And that was your quote. <laughs> <laughs> your estimation of the future. Very smart. Okay, so uh, we had uh, a wonderful hour. Thanks a lot. I'm, I'm sorry we can't take more questions, uh, but uh, I remember audience that there is a Slack channel that is uh, constantly on. Um, so feel free to, to ask questions th there. Um, thanks again to the speakers. It was very, very inspiring to uh, hear in your talks. Uh, Bernardo had to leave and uh, uh, he says hi to everyone. Uh, thanks again, Marcello, uh, Stefan and Stefano for being with us. And uh, uh, I leave with the uh, next, uh, with the announcement of the next event in the networking channel. In a, a couple of weeks, from in, in two weeks from now, you will hear about this uh, other exciting topic, uh, evolving AI architecture in support of heterogeneous and end-to-end -end next generation networks. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, to all the audience, stay tuned for the next event in the networking channel. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone.